Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Always Moving Podcast, episode 22, my biggest one yet. Jaya, how are you? Thank you for being on the show. I've ever since I watched the documentary with you, I've just been a fan, so I appreciate it. And how are you? I'm okay. Um, <clears throat> the island life is pretty chill. It's nice being back home. I've, I've moved home. Uh, I've been home since 2017. Yeah. Uh, it's pretty chill. It's very slow here on the islands, but, um, you know, I'm not complaining about it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the nice thing. Um, so maybe tell everyone who doesn't know you a little bit about yourself. And when you say the island, it's American Samoa. So, uh, um, my name is Jaya Tawasui Sememativa Sandua. Um, I'm 32, um, born and raised in the island of Tutuila in American Samoa. Um, oh, there's so much. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a lot of pressure on that question. Right? No, no, no pressure. It's just, I don't know where to begin. Um, so I'm, I was recognized by FIFA, which is the ruling body of soccer in the world. Um, as the first transgender woman to compete in a FIFA sanctioned tournament, that was the World Cup qualifiers in um, 2011, was it? <laughs> <laughs> I think you know better than me. <laughs> and uh, ever since then, um, it's just been a roller coaster ride of, you know, a lot of different experiences around the world. Um, speaking engagements and all these things that um, came with the platform, the responsibility of having to be a voice for transgender athletes all around the world and aspiring transgender athletes. Um, and around the same time, during the same tournament, there was a, a film crew from Archer's Mark in the UK who were filming a documentary about why the American Samoa side kept coming into, you know, FIFA tournaments, being that at, um, they were recognized as one of the worst teams in the world. And um, we never saw it that way as a team. For us, it was just about, you know, playing the sport, yeah. um, what we love to do and um, doing it at the best of our abilities, considering the resources that we had and, um, the level of training that we received. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, uh, the documentary was shot. It went off to um, into production and it was released at the Tribeca Film Festival in 2014, which I had the honors of attending with um, my teammate, Nikki, who was the goalkeeper. Yeah. Um, the same goalkeeper who was Look at me going off. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I'm just um, but yeah, um, after Tribeca Film Festival, it's been one film festival after another. And like I said, speaking engagements and attending um, pride events, yeah. you know, like that, things of that nature. And so it's been um, a really fast experience for me, different from what I'm used to because I come from the islands. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's not, it's kind of nice to be back home where, you know, things are just chill again. Yeah. Well, uh, again, I appreciate you being on. And um, if one, of my, one of my uh, kind of different questions was with the COVID situation, what's COVID like in American Samoa? Because it's pretty small island, so. Very small and we're very secluded where, um, deep in the South Pacific. So um, it would take a five, five hour flight for us to get to Hawaii. And the only access to American Samoa right now is um, through uh, like con the container ship to bring products yeah. from or whatever, and yeah. That, that, yeah. And even the crew who come on ships, they, they are held at sea and then our Department of Health goes out and, oh, you know, yeah. sure that they're, you know, in their full hazmat gear and all of that and make sure yeah. none of them have COVID. And, um, and 
one of the one of the times that ship came there were two cases there were two people who had covid so they weren't allowed on to shore they had to stay on the ship yeah. um so we're very strict with our um because we're a small island the population yeah. is 5,000. Our borders are still closed. We have zero cases since the pandemic. Um, so yeah, I, it's safe to say that we're good with COVID. <laughs> we, we, we have had um, restrictions though, like we had curfew. Um, we, we have to wear masks out in public. Okay. Um, I've had two repa repatriation flights so far and both times they had to spend two weeks in the hotel yeah. um, to and then even after they were released the staff had to quarantine yeah. um, so we're our measures are good and it works well for us since we have zero COVID cases <laughs> yeah no that sounds good because as I said before I'm from Canada and they're pretty strict but then I moved to Florida and they're not strict whatsoever <laughs> it's, it's insane to the stuff I see around here yeah. so, um, <laughs> So no, I'm, I, uh, it's good to hear uh, that, uh, especially that you're such a small island that you guys are taking care of. Yeah, it, it would spread so fast. <laughs> That's good. So enough about COVID because no one wants to talk COVID because it's yeah, boring. Every day, right? <laughs> so since you're a soccer player, I was curious, when, when did you start playing? Um, I started playing uh, when I was 11 years old at the time. So I went to a private school, a private Christian school called the South Pacific International Christian Center. Um, so we didn't have, the only competitions that we would have at this private school were like the math competition or okay. you know, the young writers competition, all these, um, there, were, there weren't many extracurricular um, activities for us. And, and so um, the Football Federation of American Samoa um, introduced this program where um, it was focused on youth development. And at the time, the public school elementary league had already been, um, they, they, for two years, they had already had a public school league, but there were no leagues for private schools. Yeah. And so a part of the initiative was to include private schools. And so when I was 11 years old, the Football Federation came to our school and said, does your school want to start a soccer team? And none of us knew how to play any kind of sports. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we, we took a team. Um, and that first year that uh, we were introduced into the private school league, we took the championship title nice. for the private school. Yeah. yeah, and I, the island-wide private school, most valuable player, which is like the best player on island. <laughs> yeah, awesome, congrats. So, yeah, and so I figured, wow, this I'm pretty, I'm good enough to win the MVP title, so I might as well, you know, this is something that I like to do. Yeah. It's fun. Yeah. Um, so why not? Yeah. That's, because for me, as a handball player, it was the same thing. It, these opportunities came up out of nowhere and it's like, well, this is cool. Why not? And so right. within three weeks of playing handball, I was in Brazil for a tournament and I'm like, what? Well, I'm, like well, I'm going to keep doing this. <laughs> so it's like, okay, this is fun. <laughs> wow. So, so then um, from there, you, what, how old were you when you started with the, the, the national team? Um, so 11 years old, started playing soccer. Um, three years later, when I was 14, um, I got drafted to the senior national team. It wasn't even like an under 20 or an under 17. It was the, um, the senior national team. And I got drafted to, you know, at least train with them. So I started training with them. And, um, and then I started traveling with them. Uh, we would go to... Um, Samoa to Fiji, you know, different countries in the region because we were part of the Oceania Football Confederation. Um, <clears throat> but it wasn't until years later where I actually got to play. Yeah. Um, I was still a substitute, but they put me in. I had to come back to American Samoa because it was um, our finals period. So my dad said I could go on this trip if I 
came back in time for finals. So while I was on the trip, I would train and do my homework and, yeah. you know, <laughs> then study. And then I had to leave the tournament early so that I could um, take my final exams. And, you know, as a pity move from the coach, he just put me in because I had to leave the next day and I hadn't played the last three games. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was my, but I didn't get my first um, I didn't get to start until 2011. That was my first time starting. So years later. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I guess that happened in the, the documentary. Everyone would have yeah. seen, right? So what was it like being, like getting your first start on the team? And it seemed like it was unexpected, according to the documentary at least. So Well, I've been so... I've been so used to being a reserve, um, but it was different this time because <clears throat> we were introduced to um, a different kind of training. You know, Thomas Rongen was the, cut, the, the Dutch coach that was um, hired by the U.S. Soccer Federation to, you know, help the Football Federation of American Samoa. Um, with him, it was... It was a different experience, you know. We he focused on the entire aspect of the game, yeah. um, not just the skills and the technique, uh, which was by far what we were able to um, a lot more than what we were used to um, learning and training with during uh, previous uh, tournaments. Yeah, but. Also, the things we ate, measuring our weight, um, you know, monitoring the, we, we had camps that would, where he would um, have the cook, you know, make us food that was fit for an athlete, an yeah. international athlete, and then, you know, measure our blood pressure and all those kinds of things, you know, all the things that would make uh, a good athlete a good athlete. Yeah. And so, um, that's where I really felt like I grew because I was, you know, adamant about taking in as much as we can um, from this man. Yeah. Because, you know, it, it was a rare opportunity for us to have such a, you know, a, a prestigious coach, um, you know, train us. Yeah. Then, um, what was it like being a part of your country's first ever win? um because that's that's history right there I didn't know how to feel um <clears throat> I wasn't in I wasn't in the 31-0 loss against Australia but our our ref our referee our goalkeeper was Nikki Salapu um so I imagine it was more rewarding for him than it was for anybody else on the team at the time yeah um, but it was such an emotional win for us because for years it it has been 15-0, 5-0, you know. Um, but to actually win a game. <sighs> yeah. No, I almost <laughs> I, every, even when even when the the Hollywood remake was filming, I was on set when they were filming this scene, and I couldn't hold back the tears. You know, just reliving the experience in my mind, and like the emotion started to flood back in, and it's just I don't know. I words can't explain. Yeah, never had an experience where you know finally after years and years and years of doing something, and you finally get it. Yeah feelings i feel like i can relate to that because we did um we did the pan am games which is i don't know if you know it but it's like uh kind of uk um so we did it was a four-year window of training camps games everything and when they finally announced the team and i made it uh oh, the next oh. time i heard the canadian national anthem i was just crying and oh, I, people like look at me like I'm weird and they're like, no, no, 
This meant so much when you did it. So. I, I've been playing for the American Samoa National Team for a very long time. And every single time I hear the national anthem, I still cry. I'm, yeah. I'm probably the only person <laughs> I still cry. So uh, one of the, as an athlete as well, when you, when the documentary was being filmed, what was it like trying to focus on the camp and do it your was, best, but there's cameras everywhere and. Right. No, there was, there weren't cameras everywhere. There was one camera. <laughs> okay, there was one camera. Okay, but. Um, the second time they came around, they had two cameras, but there was one red camera that was, you know, barely even noticeable. Oh. Um, Thomas Rongen had, unless we were doing individual interviews, it was actually up close with, you know, but Thomas had told the, the, the film crew, stay away, um, don't distract us. Um, Dave Tamwa, who is the CEO of the Football Federation, had already made an uh, agreement with them. You can film us, just don't get in the way of our training sessions and, you know, don't um, be a distraction to the team. So they had already understood Steve, Steve Jameson and Brett and Mike Brett and um, the whole crew of three people <laughs> um, already understood that, you know, they had to maintain their distance when it came to training sessions. Okay. Because I was curious about that because if that happened when I was at a training camp, I would totally try to get on the film or whatever. So. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, none of us thought it would be it would turn out to be a huge project so yeah. we didn't really we weren't really paying attention that's how raw the documentary was nobody yeah. really into it unless we were you know actually answering questions from them individually okay because that was definitely something i was curious about um so then after the documentary came out your life has been completely changed <laughs> yes uh, i'm i was used to traveling in the pacific region because of soccer and then you know this platform of being the first transgender in the world to compete in a fifa sanctioned tournament just exploded because of the document um you know because of the exposure from the documentary um so yeah i went on to do interviews on bbc and cnn and nbc and um, newspaper interviews with the Guardian and the New York Times and, and this podcast oh, and yeah, this podcast <laughs> it, it it went from zero to a hundred real quick for yeah. me um, and I wasn't prepared for it no uh, I'm not an advocate for transgender rights at the time I wasn't no. I was an athlete who loved to do what you know who loved to play soccer um, who grew up in an in an environment that was accommodating of what Western, what English speaking people call transgenders. And so um, it was new to me and I had to learn. It was a learning experience for me just as much of, as it was for, you know, viewers and readers. Um, I had to arm myself with the knowledge I, you know, read up on, um, Janet Mock and, you know, transgender icons around the world that um, knew what to say in interviews and, you know, the terminology and all that stuff. So, um, yeah, it was a learning experience. And now, being back on the island, are, are you like the biggest celeb walking around? <laughs> no. <laughs> people know me and still want to take pictures and um you know but it's not it's not this you know paparazzi okay. experience That's <laughs> nice. <laughs> so then the one thing i was curious about was after the documentary would you say soccer has grown a lot in american Samoa? It, it has not after the the documentary but after the win after the win uh, we came home and, you know, by that time we had already made headlines and um, the youth involvement or participation had tripled within the next year. Um, so our youth tournaments would, you know, range from maybe 60 to 80 children 
and um, just last year there were almost 400 um, youth involved in the tournament. So um, that's amazing. The, yeah, the new challenge for the football federation now is to, you know, maintain the interest. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there aren't a, there are opportunities within the national team, but there aren't a lot of opportunities outside of. Um, you know, local trainings and traveling within the Pacific region. Yeah. Um, what they're what they're looking at now is you know uh, recruiting. I mean, um, getting recruits to the islands or at least submitting um, highlight reels for you know talented youth players who want to go off and you know who are seeking scholarships to colleges and stuff like that. Yeah. Who want to in you know semi-pro or professional clubs in the mainland U.S. or around the region. Um, we have had some offers from some um, soccer clubs around the region for uh, some of our players who wish it was the first time yeah. for some players to join their ranks, you know. So we're getting there, but it's, it's a journey mm -hmm. and it, it's going to take a lot more work and dedication and resources. Yeah. Uh, for that to happen. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, it's a uh, it's similar kind of for us with handball in Canada because when I started our high school league, we maybe had like ten teams, and then like in all the province, and then now there's thirty plus forty. It's uh -huh. grown substantially, so it's it's cool to be like at that lower stage and see where it's got to. So. <laughs> Is there like a, a, a sport that's, is hockey like the main sport in Canada? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would, would be hockey. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's hard to get, um, to have the youth break away from their interest in football. Not that, you know, we're trying to tell them not to play American football anymore, but um, the competition in American football is a lot higher than it is um, for soccer here so yeah it's a, right we have um yeah the same issues because everyone there's so much more money if you want to play basketball or hockey or american football so it's like well if i'm good at this sport and this sport why would i play this sport that's you have to pay to play on the national team you have right. to do all this stuff so thankfully i found this sport because i couldn't play anything else <laughs> <laughs> um so then there was a couple of things i was curious when you were coming up because you started at 11 and then going on and doing these tournaments and then going with the national team were there like challenges that you overcame to get where you are now that you think really like a, a specific moment that really helped you be stronger today are there times that kind of stick with you um, <clears throat> not as a youth, um, growing up, it's, it's a lot more complicated to explain than it is for me to live in the, in the experience of growing up in American Samoa. Um, <clears throat> it isn't, it, being transgender isn't as challenging as it, as I imagine it must be, um, in American Samoa. It's not so taboo to be so out and so active and so involved in things like sports and, you know, um, which is which is probably why a lot of Fafa Fine in, in, in American Samoa and in Samoa, the independent state of Samoa, um, grew up to be, you know, very useful in the community and in society. Um, yeah, we're just nurtured differently, I guess. Yeah. Um, and I have the, the culture and the traditions to credit and, you know, the way of life, the nature, just the, the general nature of the Samoan people and, you know, people in the Pacific region. Yeah, that, that was something that you were, you described in the documentary that it's, it was great to hear about in the, the Samoan culture, but from like where I'm from in Canada or in the US, it's still, 
it's this controversial issue and people have they're not comfortable with it and it's it's kind right. of discouraging at the same time so that's why that's why it's such a big deal when you know western the bigger western countries um see that i'm so comfortable with my teammates to you it's wow they're so comfortable around her and but for us it's completely normal yeah so yeah. our realities are so different that um they shape our perspectives on you know human reaction towards you know yeah. transgender people or fafa fina in my case um no i agree with you and it's uh yeah uh, it's i wish it wasn't the way it is <laughs> uh, especially is right from rural canada so it's all like countryside and they have problems with things that don't make any sense <laughs> like right. like um the us so, <laughs> uh, um would you say as you've seen as you've gone around and given lectures and talks and stuff would you say inclusion has improved in um or in western culture or, or you know when when i'm giving um <clears throat> when i'm giving speeches and talking about inclusion they're almost always to audiences who already yeah that this um you know who who already who are already inclusive and who already have this set of mentalities um all i'm doing is just amplifying it and you know giving it a seal of approval you know <laughs> something like that yeah yeah uh, i think the challenge is to target audiences that <clears throat> you know don't understand who aren't as accepting, uh, accepting of, of um transgender people or rainbow soji people in general um so i don't know how how do you measure the level of acceptance or inclusion in, in the world um i think it has improved um visibility has improved representation has improved um we are being portrayed more positively in you know the media yeah. and um in hollywood you know where major outlets have learned they become a platform for <clears throat> transgender icons to um to teach yeah. and audiences learn um so i i think it's safe to say that um inclusion has improved around the world but there is so much more work to yeah, be done there's a lot still to go um so for someone in kind of my role in a cuz from a, an app an international athlete in a western society what's something you think i could do to help with awareness or help at all or this this having a conversation with you know using your platform to um to educate inviting trans athletes on so what you're doing now um also being involved in your community where you know um one of the most reassuring or most powerful um allies for um rainbow the rainbow community are our cisgender and heterosexual um allies yeah. you know as their your experience is different but you don't use that as a a reason to you know discriminate against other people yeah. and so stand that there are differences and you recognize that you have a privilege um that we don't <clears throat> and so you use that privilege you know to to help make it better or easier for for us well i'm i'm glad you came on i I'm, i'm enjoying i'm learning just listening to you and i hope the people that hear this will learn something as well especially if uh they're less open about it than maybe i am so i'm hoping right. if i can reach one person then 
my little podcast <laughs> did a job. Well, it's, right. <laughs> if we if we live life having changed but one life, rewarding enough, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, so I don't want to keep you too much longer. I got one more thing I want to touch on and then we're going to do a, a little rapid fire question thing. I've got like six questions. You just got to blurt out your answer. Um, okay. the Hollywood remake, the movie, how was this whole process? That's so exciting. I, uh, <clears throat> so not, not long after the documentary came out, um, Taika Waititi had taken interest and um, he got in contact with the documentary um, producer and film crew and um, they talked about it and what came of it was a contract. And so um, I thought, why not? <laughs> so, I signed the contract and um, so many years went by. I'm not gonna say how many years. <laughs> um, and I thought, wow, this is not gonna happen. He probably lost interest, you know? Um, he doesn't wanna do it anymore. Yeah. And then the next thing I know, I get an email saying they're gonna start um, production for Next Go Wins, the Hollywood remake. Yeah, I'm so excited because <laughs> my name would be in the Hollywood film, and um, that's yeah. So I got invited to come on to set while they were filming last year. Was it last year? No, 2019, Christmas of 2019, I think. Yeah, and was it? <laughs> I can't remember if. It was Last Christmas or <laughs> 2019. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I got to just live in the experience. I were experience the film being made. Yeah. And it was so surreal for me seeing actors and seeing Michael Fassbender and you know these Hollywood A-listers and um, just reenacting the experiences of my life you know yeah. it I, was it was surreal yeah, I can't imagine <laughs> I don't know like someone watching or I'm doing getting, what I did at a moment it would be crazy and then boom it's on a Hollywood film yeah. <laughs> that is so yeah, exciting Taimana is she's freaking amazing she's yeah. so talented the natural this is her debut so the world better look out for Taimana because she's she's gonna get. <laughs> uh, it's so exciting. Yeah, when I because I when I first watched the documentary, it was after the Pan Am Games, and I was flying home alone, and I watched uh, the documentary and the the whole the team and you guys you win the first game and this all happens and I'm sitting alone on the plane just crying by myself oh. and, and then, like the. Uh, one of the hostess on lot on the airplane they're like are you okay i'm like yeah i'm fine i'm fine <laughs> and I'm like, so oh. when i saw that the the movie was gonna be made i was thrilled and i couldn't imagine having a movie based around my life <laughs> it's, it's important to, for fans to know that it's not the documentary you yeah. know Heiko will do what he pleases with whatever project he you know he he does yeah. um so like a hybrid version of the documentary. Things are amplified, things are left out. Yeah. Just, you know, I, I don't want fans to go into it with an expectation of, you know, yeah, yeah. exact events as fans usually do yeah. when documentaries are remade. Yeah. Um, so, you know, just enjoy it for what it is. Um, it's going to be just as entertaining, if not a lot more entertaining <laughs> than documentary. Um, so yeah, that's so cool. <laughs> I'm just, I can't say anything more besides that's so cool. I, I love it. <laughs> okay, Jaya, last thing I usually end up doing this with uh, my guests, it's just going to be a quick rapid fire first answer <laughs> that comes into your head. <laughs> okay, okay, favorite soccer player, 
Cristiano Ronaldo. He's so hot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, dream vacation. Um, Tahiti. Um, what's the best meal that you prepare? Oh, I'm pretty good. I make a lot of really good things. Um, chicken soup. Chicken soup. That's your that's your specialty. Mm -hmm. uh, your least favorite country to play against? Samoa. <laughs> <laughs> Huge rivals. Um, who is someone you would consider your hero? Oh my gosh! Rap <laughs> in a rap fire. Yeah, that's um, a tough one. That was a tough one. Um, so many. Um, my grandmother, La Loifi, the late La Loifi. Can I say why? <laughs> yeah, hundred um, percent. So when I was younger, a lot of my time was spent with her, and she taught me being around her a lot. Taught me patience, and you know love for the elderly and care, um, <clears throat> you know, um, being, it taught me to be someone that cares for other people, you know, especially the elderly. Um, so yeah, my grandmother, my like late grandmother, Luigi, she taught me a lot. I like that. Even if that still, you know, makes me cry. <laughs> <laughs> um, one last rapid fire. I feel like that was such a good ending for it, but <laughs> Um, what's your favorite pump up song before a game? The national anthem can, you know, it can't, you can listen to whatever song in the locker room or whatever, but once the national anthem plays, then nothing else can pump you up more than that. 100% <laughs> agree. Great answer. Jaya, thank you so much for being on. I won't keep you any oh. longer. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for using your platform to, you know, spread inclusion. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's an honor. And thank you so much again. And so fitting. It, it, yesterday was Transgender Day of Disability. So thank you for amplifying my disability. Perfect. <laughs> and uh, for everyone listening, I hope you enjoy. Check out Jaya, Instagram, right. check out everything. And um, this has been the Always Moving Podcast. And let's. Keep things moving.